All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, everybody can hear me okay, right? Good. All right, I have four kids, so I'm very loud. Uh, if it gets too loud, just let me know. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for attending the Ain't Nobody, Not Your Mama's Headless Drupal Showcase. Uh, during this showcase, we will be discussing and, dis and demonstrating some of the remarkable ways that Drupal can manage, operate on, and display distributed domain and non-domain content, regardless of how and where it is stored. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to take a, a quick poll of the folks in the audience. How many developers do we have here today? Yeah, my people. <laughs> how about project managers or program coordinators? All right, you guys are all right, too. Um, and uh, finally, do we have any uh, business development people here? Oh, not a one, so I can keep talking fast. <laughs> All right, so although today's uh, focus is going to be on bodiless Drupal, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about the concept of headless Drupal. We will be touching on this a little later. Um, a headless Drupal application, as uh, many of you may already know, uh, does not deal with the display of the content. Authors and editors populate the Drupal database and file systems with content. And they also use other internal, external, or third-party applications uh, to display that content. Now, Drupal 8 makes this very easy through core support of RESTful web services and contrib modules like JSON API. Um, I do want to make one very quick promise to everyone. I'm going to do my very best to work in every possible David Lee Roth reference that I can think of. And now it all makes sense, right? <laughs> okay, so now for the moment you have all been so eagerly waiting for. Uh, first a little bit, you guys left that in there on purpose, didn't you? That's not supposed to be there. Oh, wait. <laughs> but now I look at this guy, I think I prefer the first one better. <sighs> um, so just a, a little bit about me. Um, in addition to these stellar credentials, I'm a developer with Quotient Inc. Um, I'm 15 years into my 40 years to life sentence. Um, I mainly work with federal clients, uh, but I've also done some hard time with educational institutions and some commercial customers. All right, so is everybody ready? Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> wait. Look, I know it's only 11 o'clock in the morning, so I'll give you a pass on that one. So is everybody ready? Yeah. Okay. That's how we do it. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to cover today is we're going to start our epic adventure by setting, a, setting the stage with a cursory overview of one of our clients. Uh, we're also going to delve into the major problems we addressed. Uh, we'll take a look at the setting or the constraints. Uh, and finally, we're going to work our way through the typical solution, the alternative, and extend the alternative to incorporate a little bit of headless action into the mix. And finally, we'll, we will be taking a look at our experiences in implementing bodyless Drupal. All right, so first, a little bit about our client in a very nondescript, non-informative way. Uh, so IT in general is not an inexpensive endeavor. Costs extend beyond dollars spent buying hardware, building or buying new software, and managing systems evolution. They also include user training, lost productivity, morale, so Think about the last time when you had to learn yet another system. Uh, they also include integration support, and the list goes on. So when one of our clients came to us with a not-so-unique problem, we began to think a little outside of the box. The client had invested a substantial amount of time, money, and resources into creating a centralized data repository containing millions of digital records. These records were contributed and managed by departments across the entire organization. All of these departments also had their own databases, flat files, static websites, and were using their own non-Drupal content management system. So to answer the problem, we're actually going to begin with a very few important questions. Um, first, how are we going to leverage all of this domain content to build a website that not only maximizes our clients' return on investment of their existing systems, and storage solutions, but also minimizes the disruptions typically caused by introducing new systems into existing processes. We don't want content maintainers to have to learn yet another content management system if they don't have to. So how can we also accommodate all of these external systems? 
And can this solution offer clients who maybe haven't made the head first plunge into Drupal a way to transition to an interim, intermediate, or long-term Drupal solution? And we all know that's what they really want. Okay, so for the setting, we've got our data. Oh brother, do we have data, and it's everywhere. But the client already has well entrenched processes around this data. So in this instance, wholesale migration is not an option. Remember that ROI and disruption stuff we talked about earlier. Finally, we are bound by the client's infrastructure. Fortunately, that infrastructure supports Drupal. So let's take a look at a typical vanilla Drupal solution. So that looks pr pretty familiar, right? Uh, so the typical solution is to go all in with one system. Uh, for example, we would do a mass migration of existing data into Drupal. But that can be disruptive, expensive, and can waste those previous investments. It could be a good idea, on the other hand, if the client needed or wanted to deprecate legacy systems. So how's everyone doing so far? Are we bored to tears yet? No? So I saw some so-sos. And... Okay. So we'll keep going. Um, feel free to throw things. Um, if you have a question, um, you know, I want to make this more of a collaborative thing. I hate talking to people. I like talking with people. Um, so just, you know, raise your hand, yell. I answer to a lot of things. All right, so let's go ahead and shake this typical solution up and look at the alternative. So a quick word of warning here. Don't get hung up on the names. We've given things names that we find mildly humorous, kind of like this presentation. Um, but they're useful. So trust me, it could have been much worse. I wouldn't be able to stand up here and give a thought-provoking session about something that I called topless. <laughs> so what we're talking about at an architectural level is, a, is the different ways that Drupal can be used to solve problems. So, so far this looks exactly like the typical solution, vanilla Drupal, right? Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to wake you up. <laughs> but we are missing one key ingredient to this recipe. Remember all those gobs and gobs of data that we talked about? So a bodyless Drupal application does not store or manage the domain content. Rather, it accesses domain content and data that is stored in some other uh, location. So it makes no difference whether your data is retrieved from a repo, a database, a file system, API, or even that terms of service violating server you connected using grandma's ISP connection. <laughs> I see some guilty faces out there. <laughs> so while I'm standing here with my back against the projector screen, I bet you want to see what I mean. So we might as well jump into a brief demo. Yeah? David Lee Roth? I nailed it. I nailed it. <laughs> so we're going to take a few minutes to dive into uh, to the code here. And what I really want you to focus on is how few lines of code this actually takes. Uh, we're doing all of this, um, this base example with, with around about 100 lines of code. Um, and all of these examples will be available uh, through the, the GitHub repo. Pardon me, I failed speaking when I won, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so first, we'll take a look at the back end of Drupal. And this is going to support our bodyless solution. Uh, what we've done is we have a very small module that uh, uses the form API. And this provides us and the content editors and authors a way to edit external data. Um, so what this example is using, uh, we're going to use an, a text file that lives outside of Drupal, and that's going to be a representative of our external data. Um, if only it were that easy. Uh, so what we have here is the typical uh, Drupal admin form to edit the content. And we will go ahead and just edit it slightly. So what happens with this is that we've actually edited the source data that lives outside of Drupal. 
And when we go into Drupal, we're going to use the front end to render it, which is the bodyless component of this. So when I refresh the page, we are actually pulling in <laughs> our external text file, and now we can see that forevermore, David Lee Roth will be a rock god. So that's a, a pretty simple solution there, um, representative uh, visually of how we're doing things. Um, you guys want me to go ahead and dive into the code a little? I'll leave the choice up to you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought so. So we can see in our bodiless solution here, um, all we're running with is a controller. Uh, we have a very small template and the typical Drupal 8 setup files. We have routing, um, an empty module file, and the info file. So we'll start with the routing first. Um, very standard way of doing it. We will let Drupal drive the path to our bodyless application, reference our controller, and uh, in this instance, that blanked up the title. Um, as we can see here, um, for the module, we added just a simple theme hook and the standard info file. Now, we also have the extent of my front end experience in this template. I mean, this is pushing it, really pushing it. Um, and the important part that we're going to look at is the controller. And this is it. So you can see within 33 lines of code and about 14 lines of comments. How many of you get paid by line of code? This is perfect. Um, we can see the, the one function that we call is just using the rudimentary PHP function to read in our external file and then pass that on to our wicked awesome template. Um, the thing you want to obviously customize in this solution is adding in the way you get the content. So this is where you would put all of your logic to connect to the external systems, APIs, um, and, and things like that. All right. You're going to have to speak up. The admin form. Uh, that is down in the bodyless and headless section. You're jumping ahead of me, Rebecca. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so setting up the form is also very easy. Um, just because this was a text file, we needed one text area uh, to edit. Uh, so we have the typical form API set up here. Uh, we are also doing extensive validation. Um, and uh, our submit form, all it does is write the data back to the flat file. So while this isn't a complete example, it gives the basis behind what we're doing. So I'm going to keep begging you until somebody asks a question. Uh, do we have any questions yet? No. All right, man, can you a fake one? OK, uh, so we've gone through our bodyless demo. And that's good if uh, your client wants to continue using Drupal as the front end. <clears throat> but we want to extend this a little bit and to include some of the headless stuff that we've been uh, hearing about, you know, yesterday, the rest of today, and some tomorrow and Friday. So what if your client asks for more beyond the typical Drupal website? Maybe they need things like kiosks, interactives, IVR, or another lightweight framework they want to put on top. So in this instance, an application can be both bodiless and headless. And there's a running joke in our office that <clears throat> this is what we call soulless Drupal. So let's take a moment to explore how we can stretch Drupal even further. And what we're going to do is we're going to cherry pick the pieces of Drupal that we want to use. Um, Drupal is the framework, but the framework is only used for performing CRUD applications. So those are your create, read, update, and delete actions on domain data. The domain data is stored elsewhere, which makes it bodiless. 
and it's delivered via non-Drupal front ends, which makes it headless. Uh, and they access the content via RESTful Web Services API, JSON API, or bypassing Drupal entirely. Uh, so we're now we're going to take a look at how these types of application level Drupal. Um, I do apologize. I couldn't think of a good uh, David Lee Roth reference for this transition. Um, so if you're still humming jump in your head, uh, we'll just go ahead and stick with that. All right, so let's dive right into the, uh, the bodyless and headless Drupal demo. All right, first I'm going to go ahead and show you how that works. Um, you remember our, our form here in the bodyless example. What we're going to do is edit that one more time just to prove to you that it works. And we'll go ahead and submit that. Now, powering this bodyless and headless application, I just spun up a very quick Node.js app. Um, I'm not a Node.js developer, so if anyone else is here, please don't judge me. And we can see we have our Node application here. And with a simple refresh, now we can see that, yes, David Lee Roth actually is a rock god. And it's proven by Node.js. Um, so let's take a, a little deeper dive into this example here. So we've seen the form for the administrative side already, so I can skip over that one. Um, this one is a little bit deeper. Uh, we have the routing, uh, which allows us to edit th the external file and creates the form, or gives us the route to the form. We also have a path in case we wanted to check this against Drupal, just to make sure. Um, we've also added some permissions to this one. So now we will limit the people that can actually edit the content, um, as well as view the content. Um, we've added in links to the admin. And what this one does uh, is it adds that tab to the content page. So if we go back to Drupal, and we're editing content. Sometimes it's easy uh, to give users, authors, and editors a visual cue. If we're dealing with a lot of data, um, we'll some, we will segment these into tabs across the content screen. So it's just a little bit easier to get to than rooting through all the content. And of course, we have our info file. All right, so this is uh, the main meat behind our bodyless and headless application on the Drupal end. So you can see we're pulling in the text file, um, and we're leveraging the form builder, again, down here to create the form. And then when we look at the, oh, we've already seen that one. But you know what, why not do it twice? Uh, this, is, this one is actually for the bodyless one. So uh, the only thing that's required for this one is the form API, because we are not using Drupal to render it. We're not using uh, Drupal to store the data. And we have our sample JSON file here. See, I told you I don't do no JS. Um, all this one is doing is it's um, going out and rendering the file through a, a file read. And that's pretty much it. We have now completely torn the soul out of Drupal. I hope you're happy with yourself. <laughs> okay, so those examples look awesome, but the real question is, does this really work in the real world? So if all this seems a little far-fetched, like a bunch of geeks just trying to have fun, um, here's a very condensed version of some of the real client work we've done for the past four years at Quotient. As you can see, Drupal 8 is not required, uh, though it certainly does make the job much, much easier. Uh, we've been doing this for years using Drupal 6 and 7, and this was long before headless and bodiless were known as things. So the answer to does this really work is yes, of course it is. Why wouldn't it work? 
Uh, so the beauty in bodiless solutions is that you do not have to migrate every project you encounter. And quite often, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just swap out that hub. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you find yourself looking at rebuilding one or more legacy applications, or working with distributed or disparate data, take a look at leveraging that existing data first and wow your clients with the, effective, with the efficiencies you can achieve by going bodiless. That was very exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I know we have tons of time left. Um, again, it's because I have four kids, I yell a lot, I talk fast, I have to. Um, so if there's any questions out there, um, sure. Uh, actually, we have a microphone. Uh, no, I'm, I can talk for a while. Yes. Uh, four kids. Four, yeah. That's not my question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that was your one question. <laughs> Um, we've done that. The solution, the, the good thing about this solution is it's very flexible. So you can link nodes to external content. Um, we've done that for repositories. So we'll have uh, sample nodes in the database um, and they link out to uh, external content in other systems. Um, you can also leverage existing APIs from multiple locations at the same time. Um, what we would typically use the Drupal database for in that instance is we would do some pre-processing of the data, add in the business logic, and Drupal basically stores the throwaway display data. Um, so it can get refreshed and it doesn't matter, it doesn't become um, the organizational uh, content that the organization relies on. All right. Um, this is actually out on GitHub. Uh, if, you know, if you come over to the booth after we're done, I'll be there for a while. Um, we can go over it in some more detail. Um, I'll show you where the repo is. Um, and, and it's out there now. So a nice little starting point. Sure. Um, well, that was one of the major problems uh, that we had discovered along the way into crafting these solutions. Um, there's a lot of time and effort and training that goes into learning a content management system. Uh, so when you have things, users using like SharePoint, there's a ton of processes around those as far as like checking in and out files, uh, managing workflows. Um, and it, it really gets into any content management system as well, not just a document repo. Um, so what we do is we leverage the APIs that are available through those systems and we link to them through Drupal. We do our pre-processing, post-processing in there. The benefit of that is that there is minimal disruption to the user community that's already using these content management systems. Uh, so you don't have to retrain them on Drupal. Um, they can take their Excel spreadsheets and upload them to wherever Excel spreadsheets go in the ether. Um, and things like that. So it's, it's highly flexible in keeping the existing processes in place. Uh, we come in and you know, provide the solutions that kind of bolt on top of those. So uh, it's not as, dis as disruptive as coming in and ripping and replacing the entire system. So my question is, if you have, if you click on the content tab, mm -hmm. will there be a list of all pieces that are leveraging the bodiless piece? And then just there's a separate tab that you go into the, the node element or whatever, and then there's a piece that's rendering that content. But you can also edit the existing body tag and wrap around that. As far as in the admin or in the display? And, well, in, in, well, in the display. Okay. So, so you'd click on uh, your node, edit. Mm -hmm. You'd have two tabs, one for the actual content stored in Drupal and then for the right. content stored in your text file. Is that possible? Yes. You can okay. definitely do that, yep. Um, and typically what we wouldn't do is edit the external content directly. Um, we have done that on certain occasions. Um, but if 
uh, you're editing the content, it's best to edit the things that are going to be from the front end forward and leave that external data alone. That's why we um, import the things we need to import, apply the business logic, stick it in Drupal, and then dump it and not have to worry about it. We can just re-import it again through whatever nightly process we're using. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Right, so what, we've, what we're doing is we're, we are leaving the proprietary organization data where it is. Uh, so if, if someone's using SharePoint, for instance, we'll stick with that one, um, all of the documents and the data live in SharePoint. What we're using Drupal for um, is pulling that data in for display purposes only. Um, and in certain, in certain instances, we will apply some business logic to it, and that's the data that we store. So it's a version of the, uh, the data of record, but it's not the data of record. It could be. And this solution, the other benefit of this solution is that um, you know, the, the authors and the editors, the marketing people, can still use Drupal to use their marketing stuff. So that kind of data will live in Drupal, but the organizational data will be outside of Drupal. Oh, this is Mike, by the way. <laughs> um, so I think there was a question earlier about you know some of these uh, non-Drupal content management interfaces that we've worked with. Um, some of them come in the form of like a weird Java app that was written by a developer or a company no longer in existence, but there's too much invested in working with that. There's you know people are used to it. You have decades of folks who. Um, have invested the time as part of their performance evaluation, part of their review process, to be efficient, to use that. This is a mechanism of leveraging that investment that, kind of as Paul said, not being disruptive. Um, so we've seen it in a couple of forms. We've seen it in Java applets that folks are using off their desktops. Uh, we've seen it in um, access forms, working against SQL servers or you know, uh, ODBC connections. Um, we've seen it in weird frame maker workflows where they've got a process that's taking information out of SQL Server, processing it for uh, publishing, actual you know, printed publishing workflow, getting it into frame maker, pushing it through. They can't change it, they can't touch that, it would disrupt everything. They want that content on the website. They want it to be accessible, they want it to be usable, visible. This is a way to avoid kind of uh, duplicating it, right? We, we had it, you know, we're already paying for SQL Server. Let's put an interface together. Let's get it up there. Let's do what we need to do. We can do some text processing. Um, you know, maybe there's some compliance stuff, accessibility stuff that we need to do before we render it. So um, those are kind of the use cases that, that we've found over the years um, where this solution has made a lot of sense. Um, Paul's also kind of mentioned that throughout these processes, there is this inevitable question of, you know, at what point do we start to put or, or store some of that content into database, into Drupal's database? Um, we've seen a couple of different situations where it starts to make sense. Um, you know, maybe the, the stuff we're getting out of SQL Server isn't written the same way that they want uh, the content to appear on the website. So, you know, with a few edits to the modules, um, you know, we can, we, flip a switch where they can start to um, you know, change that content. So the workflow goes from just being displaying it to actually storing a version of it in Drupal that can be manipulated. Um, maybe we add a sub-process to actually send that back to SQL Server. There's lots of different ways that, that this can grow iteratively uh, as the workflow you know, for our customers evolves and changes and, and embraces it. Um, kind of the other thing that, that Paul alluded to was uh, what we have found is this works really well for uh, you know large enterprise uh, government higher education institutions that have a lot of data you know tens of millions of records um, that are stored in systems that it's just not cost effective to change um, but as they hire uh, new people to join their team with more 
more of a web focus. Those folks are comfortable with web-based CMSs. They're comfortable with Drupal or WordPress or what have you. Um, this is a way to kind of get that, that ball in motion to, to, to formally reorganize the workflow and the process over time. Um, so what we've also done is we use this to set up authoring environments that use Drupal's interface, something that they're already familiar with from websites or, or you know, something they, they participate in outside of work. Um, we can actually give them that interface, that modern interface, browser-based, to manage the content in kind of, you know, the official domain repository. Um, and, and over time, that may become the preferred way to manage the data. Um, so there's a lot of different kind of branching out points. Um, and, you know, the, the examples that, that we put together here are really meant to kind of serve as, as just basic examples of the idea. Um, you know, it's not meant to be a, a reproducible module that, you know, everyone can, can kind of put out there, but it's something that, um, you know, for us has been, um, you know, really powerful going back even to, to Drupal 6, form API um, is a great way to develop interfaces for, for folks. So that's where kind of the strength of, of you know, this, this alternative to the traditional migration um, kind of comes from. But cool, hey, that's all right, now we have a line of questions. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think he answered a lot of my, uh, what I was really going to ask is like, what's the business value in doing this, like what, what, what does the company hope to get out of this, and uh, you mentioned, you know, onboarding new folks that are comfortable with the CMS, what are other, like, business value things you get out of, like, permissions, central management of permissions, or, you know, what is this type of migration by a company? Yeah, um, but the beauty about this solution and using Drupal as the framework is that you can customize and cherry pick any piece that you want out of it. Um, so you can continue using the permissions, you can continue using routing if you want to, any of the APIs. Uh, the only thing that we're, for the most part, getting rid of is the MySQL database. Um, and that's the disposable piece of it. So in uh, your example, you're taking out a particular piece of content and you know exactly what that content's going to be. Mm -hmm. I assume you've had examples in the past where you needed uh, the Drupal site to say filter a specific subset of content or per perform some sort of dynamic logic. Uh, I'm sure it depends on the system you're connecting to, but in general in your experience, since you've done this a lot of different times with a lot of different systems, have you found it easier to perform sorting and business logic on the Drupal side or to try to hook into whatever that other system's business logic is in order to pull back only the data that you wanted? So it depends, right? Great answer. I knew it. Um, <laughs> so in some cases, we, we take advantage of, of middleware. Um, we do a lot of work that involves uh, Apache Solar Lucene as middleware, um, but we've also done a lot of work with um, kind of handling those types of routines um, on the data repository side. So, um, you know, using the example I mentioned earlier, FrameMaker and SQL Server and all that, um, we actually ended up writing a very thin uh, .NET <laughs> application that gave us a, a web service interface to the content, but uh, gave us a framework to do the types of transformations that we wanted to do. By doing them on that back end side, we took the load off of the front end servers, we made it easier to kind of scale horizontally. Um, we've had situations um, a few years ago, we were working with a customer, they had a massive archive of discussion lists. And they, you know, they used various technologies over time, you know, Mailman, Piper, all sorts of different things, and, and they had this, you know, historical record going back to the early 90s of these discussions, and they didn't want to lose that. Um, but it wasn't cost effective for us to come up with a migration path to put that into Drupal, and, and there you know, are some, some limits to that. Um, there are some efficiencies to be gained, like we can search it and that kind of thing if, if they were to be nodes, but the, the, the return and the, the cost wasn't quite there. So um, Paul's actual example um, was, was very similar to our solution. This was back in, in Drupal 6 days, but um, we left those files alone. We left them on the file system. Uh, we wrote a module, not dissimilar to what Paul has here, um, that read those files off the file system. Um, did some, some cursory cleanup. So uh, as you can imagine, going back to the 90s, HTML has changed. You know, we were able to kind of clean it up, sanitize it, 
um, you know, make some compliance and accessibility changes. Um, it was fast enough, we could do it on the fly, but we also uh, elected to actually write those files back to disk. Um, and in that way, we kind of dynamically grew a replacement over time. And you know, as soon as Google or Bing or somebody searches it and crawls it, it's gonna generate it for us anyway. Um, but it, it kind of allowed us to, to, to take what would have been a month-long process of iterating over a migration script, testing it, validating it, and condense that down to a few days of work. So. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> Drupal relies, a lot of the like views and displays and layouts, all that stuff, it relies on really highly defined fields you know, um, and uh, when you look at something like, say, something horrific like Cold Fusion, right, what you got as an editor, uh, sorry, the, the person that tends to jam everything into a big HTML block, um, and I've dealt with trying to migrate this content in, and it's a, it's a real nightmare. Um, so how do you deal with going from a very loosely defined, loosely defined data to bringing it in in a useful way into Drupal. Yeah, um, we've done the static content migrations as well, um, but I think what Mike had just spoken about kind of speaks true to that. Um, if we take Cold Fusion, um, that's going to output HTML. So what we would typically do is use a crawler to determine what the rendered output files are, and then dip right into the process of uh, in including those external files doing any pre-processing, cleanup, or anything like that, and using Drupal to, uh, to display those and theme them. So just DOM, DOM processing? Yeah, uh, for the most part, we found the DOM to be easier to, to do than, than any hard like regex or, or that type of thing. Um, what we try to do in these situations is, is go back to the faster components of PHP. So any of the, the CE, standard library string functions, um, you know, we try to solve the problems with those first. Um, you know, regex is kind of, if we can't figure it out. Um, but if we need to do a lot of, of manipulation to structured content, XML, uh, HTML, um, then, then we'll use, you know, DOM processing library. Um, the nice thing is, because of, of the way that we kind of structure the solution, um, if it's something that we can't do efficiently in PHP, we can usually do it on the data repo side. Um, since typically that's going to be Oracle Java, uh, .NET, uh, C Sharp, you know, SQL Server, in some cases Cold Fusion. Um, so what we can, what we've done in the past, um, and, and we had one example of this many years ago, um, they continue to run the old Cold Fusion site um, behind the scenes, you know, on their network, off off the DMZ, off the internet, um, and we actually just edited the the templates, the Cold Fusion for that site um, so that it's fitted out in a structured way. Um, and that actually allowed us to grab that content as if it were a web service without it being yeah. a web service. Um, it allowed them to continue to use that site. That's what they were used to using. Um, but we were able to put some structure into it that we could hook into much easier, much, much more easily on the front end. Um, and in some cases, we do pull it into Drupal, um, you know, as, well, Back then, Drupal 6, it was CCK. <laughs> um, but, you know, fields, you can use field formatters, you can use entities. Um, if there's something that makes sense to break out and, and to kind of put into Drupal as a first sort of party citizen, we can do that. Um, otherwise, you're kind of left with having to come up with, like, you know, weird, you know, views hooks or, or you know, search API hooks to kind of integrate everything together. Um, so, you know, it's not. There's not one best way, I guess I would say, that, that it happens. It's, it's sort of a, again, it's a value content, you know, platform. You know, we got to weigh all of that together. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a good job. Uh, my question is around uh, search API. So have you guys implemented this uh, in then put search on top of this? So most of our customers um, most of our customers use Google search appliances, even today. Um, or they're using uh, digital dev search, 
Um, so they're using hosted search solutions. Um, so most of the time, what we're working against is an external uh, crawler indexer. Um, we have, and, and we did this a while back um, for a customer, um, leveraged, uh, gosh, this was before I think Search API code was the Apache Solar Lucene module. Um, and we used Tika, and so we actually were still able to, even though that content didn't live in Drupal as nodes, we were still able to use the modules to push it into uh, what, you know, the Drupal search in this case, which was a, a Solar Lucene index. But, um, you know, those hooks exist, they can be used. Um, the real question that, that we, we've, we've had to ask is, you know, is the, the and, and again, this is more Drupal 6, Drupal 7, but, you know, is the Drupal full text search, uh, you know, a accurate or the best way to, to track the data? So, um, you know, typically there's already extenuating circumstances for our projects and, you know, Solar's in the picture or Google search is in the picture or there's some other service that's in the picture. was not prepared for that question. I should have been. <laughs> yeah, come, come meet me down at the booth and we'll talk about it a little more because that's like, that's what I know. <laughs> Looks like everybody's as brain dead as I am, so. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, if you guys want to discuss any more with us, uh, we're down, downstairs, booth 125, all the way against the wall, almost all the way down. Um, we'll be there through the remainder.